So we're going to sing a song. And really, uh, she's going to sing along. I'm just going to sort of help her keep the tune for you. You can put this on however you need to. Because she's a lot better at this than, than I am. Is that right? So this is a little song that was written many years ago. Um, but um, like it. Uh, maybe you like it too. Are you ready? One. I wonder if the name was like the other thing. I wouldn't want to say. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I sing the word. Just like a blind man, I wondered. With dreams and tears, dream does my own. Then like the blind man that God gave back his son. Praise the Lord, I sing the word. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to understand straight, but straight is the gate and there are the way. Now I have traded the right for the right. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. Sing it with us. I saw the light. Saw the light. No more darkness. No more night. Now I'm so happy. You know, sorrow the wind. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. Thank you very much. I have a couple extra thoughts I want to share beyond my regular study. But as I said earlier, I'm reclaiming my time. I'd like for you to consider some thoughts first. And I believe this will be good for our brother Daniel who was baptized today and others that maybe are somewhat in his position who are maybe looking for a little courage at this time. I want you to look to John chapter 9 with me, and we're going to read the first five, four, five, six verses here. John chapter 9, if you want to go ahead and put it up, or we can just read it. It says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Verse 2. And the disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, in the time of Jesus, many people believed that all the sicknesses, all the illnesses you had were because you had sinned or someone had sinned. But I want you to notice what it says in verse 3. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Can you say amen to that? We have people among us that have infirmities. We have at least two folk here that can't see today and it's not their fault they can't see but some disease has come upon them from some source of some time and it doesn't mean that they sinned it doesn't mean they did wrong either verse 4 Jesus said I must work the works of him that sent me the works of, wor of him who what sent me did Jesus say he was sent to the father yes he did and it says that right in verse 4 while it is day the night cometh when no man can work as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he sped on the ground and made clay the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation what? Sent. The one who was sent from heaven sent him to the pool sent to wash his eyes. He went his way, therefore, washed and came seeing. And you know the story. The Jews, they were really upset about this, especially the leadership. They didn't like this. 
And you know, and so they had a little investigation and they called in his parents. They said, you know, how did this happen? And they said, look, you know, he's born blind. We don't know whether this happened. And, you know, we can't say anything about it. And you know why they say that? Because the Bible says that they did it because of the fear of the Jews. Because the Jews have said that anyone who acknowledged Jesus would be put out of the synagogue. And, you know, those Jews were a lot like Catholics. And they're a lot like Seventh-day Adventists today. That salvation is not in knowing cross. Salvation is in belonging to the church. You know? How many times have you heard someone say, so-and-so left the church? Jim left the church. Sister Sue left the church. Never hear them say they left Christ. The Bible says they wouldn't answer because they had fear of the Jews. But they brought the man in then, and they started to interrogate him. And he says, look, he says, no prophet's done this. He says, maybe you'd be his disciples. He said, I don't know, we're Moses' disciples. But if you look down in verse 34, they answered and said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? How dare you teach us? We are the learned doctors of Israel. And it says they cast him out. And if you look at the Greek text, the Greek text says they excommunicated him. That's what it means. They excommunicated him. And friends, that's happened to some of you, and it may happen to more of you, and it may happen to brothers or sisters or people you know in the future. But I want you to notice now in verse 35, immediately, immediately what happens upon him being cast out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now this man didn't even know he was speaking to yet, because when Jesus was there, he couldn't see him, he couldn't recognize him, you see. And so Jesus has come. He says, do you believe on the Son of God? Verse 36, he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And he worshipped him. Friends, when we are cast out, when we are excommunicated, when people put us down, when we're made to feel no good, that's the very time that Jesus personally comes to us and offers us personal fellowship with him. Amen. So, so don't, don't think that it's a bad thing when you're cast out. If you're cast out for Christ's sake, friends, it's a wonderful blessing because you get that very personal fellowship with Jesus that might not be coming any other way. I want to talk to you about buying the unbuyable. Buying the unbuyable. How do we buy the unbuyable? Anybody know what this is? What's this a picture of? That's our son. That's our son. Pretty far away, pretty hot, and uh, we see it every day, hopefully. What's this? It's the moon. Not too hard, is it? All our kids know that. Which is bigger, the sun or the moon? Which one? Sun. You all know that, right? Yeah. Okay. I saw I saw I saw one one of these YouTube things where they were interviewing some American students. You know, Americans are supposed to be smart, right? And they were interviewing these two girls. They said they just graduated and they were so smart. And he said, So I have a question for you. He said, Well, what is bigger, the sun or the moon? And they said, Hmm, this is a trick question. It must be the moon. So don't think Americans are so smart. I tell you, we're not. Some of them are very not very smart at all. What's this object right here? What do you call this? Sundial. It's the sundial. Have you ever seen something like this? Hourglass. Okay, you're pretty good. What's this? Grandfather clock, right? Yeah, big old grand... We, we call it in America grandfather clock. Pocket watch. Pocket watch, right? Bet you don't know what this is. What do you think it is? <laughs> okay. Let's just go back quickly. Just quickly. The sun, the moon, the sundial, the hourglass, the clock, and the watch. What do they all have in common? They tell time. They do a make a measurement of time. This is what scientists call an atomic clock. An atomic clock. It keeps time so accurate that we would never, ever know the difference. 
time. Time. You know, time, friends, is a very elusive idea. And we are here, almost at the end of this campaign. Our time here is almost up, isn't it? And we're going to leave this camping and we're going to go back to our homes or our different fields of working. And my question is, what are you going to do with your time? What are you going to do with that time? Are you going to waste it away or are you going to do something productive with it? Are you going to use it for the honor and glory of God? But what is time? One dictionary says, time is the measured or measurable period during which an action, process, or condition exists or continues. And the dictionary says that time is the indefinite continued progress of existence and events in the past, present, and future regarded as a whole, travel through space and time, our conception of time, one of the greatest wits of all time, some of the ways that we use time. I have a piece of software in his fact book. It says time is the progression of events and changes in the universe, often perceived as a linear sequence of past, present, and future. A linear sequence, did you get that linear, goes forward. For example, I'm not gonna really do this, but I have here this bottle with water. If I was to turn this bottle upside down, what would happen? The, the flowers would fall out, the water would all pour out, right? But if I turn it back up, I can't reverse that, can I? You can't reverse, at least we, in reverse, what has happened in the past. Time appears to be linear. Another uh, definition says time is a continued sequence of existence and events that occur in an apparently irreversible succession from the past to the present and in the future. Now notice this definition is a little different. It doesn't speak about just a linear path, but it uses a word apparently. Apparently irreversible. Now what does that word apparently mean? this situation it might be possible somehow to i mean it, it, it appears to be this way but we're leaving a little wiggle room open that it might not just simply be only irreversible until the time of albert einstein and no pun intended it was not thought that time could change or be variable but with the study of relativity most scientists believe that time can be warped as the speed of light is approached. Interestingly, Einstein said, I never think of the future, it comes soon enough. And that reminds me of something that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter six and verse 34, Jesus said, therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of its sufficient unto the day, is the evil thereof. Now, does anyone know where the first reference to time is in the Bible? Where is the first reference to time? I'm not saying necessarily the word time, but a reference to the concept of time. Where in Genesis? Chapter 1, what verse? Verse 1. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the first the, the first Hebrew words in the Hebrew text are in beginning. You, you have the, the, the preposition, and then you have the, the Hebrew word reshith, which is translated as beginning. Reshith does not express a measurement of passing events, but it implies the passage of time by the very nature of the definition beginning. Now, the first text that speaks about a measurement of time is verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. You know, we use the sun to measure days. We use the moon to measure months. Or basically, I mean, we don't exactly today, but that was the way the, the biblical months were calculated. God later declared that the movement of the heavens would be perceived times. You know, as Earth revolves around the sun, once that makes a year, Genesis 1.14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days 
and four years. So again, a day is an evening and a morning. Seven days together make a week, which ends on the seventh day with the Sabbath. And again, the moon makes the phases of the month. Now, we find a place that time is mentioned somewhat indirectly, but yet pretty clear if you just read below the surface a little bit in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. It says, and in the process of time, it uses that word time. It came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And we know that Abel brought an offering too. He brought an offering of, of a lamb. But it says in the process of time, and this expression in the process of time in the Hebrew is literally at the end of days, at the end of days. And if you think about a week, at the end of the days of the week, what day do you have? The Sabbath. What more appropriate time to bring a, a, an offering to God in worship than on the Sabbath? Now, the Bible says that there's just about a time for everything. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, he says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. There's a time to be to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. He goes on, a time to weep. You know, the Bible says weep with those that what? Weep. A time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. And then he goes on to say, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And by the way, when I'm speaking, it's a good time for you to be quiet, isn't it? Because when you want to talk to me, I'll be quiet. Can you imagine if someone came to me with a question and I just ignored them and just started talking to someone else? How would they feel? They wouldn't feel very nice, would they? Now, of course, we fully support all those folks translating. That's fine. You translate all you need to. But for the rest of us, when, my, when it's my time to speak, it's your time to be quiet, right? It says a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Though it has been said that God is timeless, there were events which God appointed at set times. For example, in Genesis 21, 22, it says, For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Remember when Abraham was, um, was, was waiting one day in the hot heat of the day and, and, and Christ and two angels appeared to him? And they said, you know, there's going to come a time about this time next year and she's going to have a son. And Abraham at first laughed and Sarah laughed. And, but they had a son. His name was Isaac. Do you remember what Isaac meant? Laughter, laughter, because they laughed. But there was a time for that. In Psalms 102, and verse 13, it says, Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the set time has come. God says he had a time for this. In Galatians 4, and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. He says, when the time was come, when the fullness of the time was come, what fullness of time was he speaking about? He was speaking about the prophecy of Daniel 9, that 70-week prophecy, right? The fullness of time was come. God sent forth his son. In John 12, 23, Jesus saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Jesus is the only person who's ever been born on this earth that knew the year, the month, the day, and even the hour he would die. He knew, based on the prophecies, exactly even when he would die. There was a set time for that. There is, according to Daniel 8, 14, a time set for the judgment. And the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We are familiar with the prophecy of Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for what? 
an appointed time. God had appointed a time for that vision to happen. That Daniel 8, 14, the 2300 days. But at the end, it shall speak, it will not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. The people didn't understand it, but friends, it didn't tarry. It was right there on time, just as it should have been. The Bible says there's a time for the coming of Jesus Christ. We don't know that time, but God has a time for it. We know that because in Matthew 24 and 36, Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. My Father. I wonder why the Holy Spirit doesn't know. That's interesting, isn't it? The value of time. The value of time. The Russian writer Tolstoy, he said the two most powerful warriors are patience and time. Patience and time. There was a very wealthy American of the 19th century. His name was Andrew Carnegie. And he accumulated a great amount of wealth. And as he was approaching his death, as he was going to die, he made an offer that if someone could find some way to extend his life 10 years, he would give them $200 million. I don't know if you know how much money that is, but in that time, $200 million would be like $2 billion today or more. It would be like, well, even at that day, it was $54,794 a day. $38 a minute, but no one could accommodate him. No one could help him because friends, you can't buy time. You can't buy time. So friends, we need to use our time properly. We're going to be leaving this camp meeting soon. Have we used our time? And you know, it's too late to ask in a sense, but maybe we can reflect upon it. Have we used our time in this camp meeting well? Have we come in and have we tried to listen carefully to our speakers? Or have we been out and I can see some people, maybe they've got things to do. I understand. We're all different. Maybe it's, you know, I had to go to the restroom a couple of times myself. I get that, right? But when I look back and I see people missing, not just from my meeting, but when Brother Anthony's speaking or, or Brother Sammy or someone's speaking, I see people just out here talking about anything. It doesn't make sense to me, friends. Have we used our time at this camp meeting well? And when we leave here, what are we going to do with our time, our talents? Because, you know, of all the talents we have, there's no talent that we will be required to give a more strict account of than the use of our time. Do you believe that? That's exactly what inspiration says, beloved. Psalms 90 and verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I don't know how long I can live. When I was younger, I was like a lot of you young people. I just felt invincible. I was going to live forever. Nothing could hurt me. I've got time to do this. I've got time to do that. But I noticed something. I noticed that it was the older people in the church that always seemed a little more serious, a little more earnest about the soon coming of Christ. You know, and I looked at that and I said, well, you know, that's just because they don't think they have much time left. And so the guy gets serious about it. Well, as David said, I've been young and now I am old. You know what? I'm a lot more serious now. I sure am. But it's not because, friends, I feel like I don't have enough days left. I believe based upon the prophecies, based upon my current health and vitality, that I have an excellent chance to live to see the coming of Jesus Christ. I want that. I, I don't know about you, but I want I desperately want it. I pray that you do too, that you will strive with all of your power to be among the 144,000. But it's not my age, but it's the experience I've accumulated through the age that helps me to understand the seriousness of life. I was 23 years old. I was 23 years old, and, and I was I was co porting at the time, selling books. And I had some appointments in the morning to visit people, and those appointments went really, really well. And I've been praying that they go really well because I was going toward an area where my father lived. 
and I hadn't seen my father for a little bit, and I wanted to spend some time with my father, and I thought, those appointments go real well. I'm going to take off the afternoon, and I'm going to go visit my father. Well, I stopped. I stopped on the way to my father's house to visit an old friend that I used to work for in a store. They had a store where we sold groceries, and we had gasoline for the petrol for the cars and things, and ended up getting into a long Bible study with him. And then a couple other people came in, they got involved in this Bible study, and we're having a long Bible study. And I should tell you that my father at this time was 51 years old. Doesn't seem too old to me today, and maybe doesn't seem too old to you. But he had been living for about five years with very serious case of diagnosed heart disease. In fact, the five years before, five years and three months before, the doctors had wanted him to have open heart surgery and they said, Mr. Stump, if you don't have the surgery, you probably can't live more than five years. But he didn't have the surgery. One reason was he'd have to quit smoking. He wasn't going to quit smoking. And I was going to go down and see my dad, but I got involved in this long Bible study. I was there for about three hours. And then the wife of the store manager, or the store owner came in. She says, you know, an ambulance passed me on the way down. And I said, well, you know, I hope my dad didn't have a heart attack and die. And so by and by, I went to my parents' home. And as I started to pull in the driveway, here's a, a, my, my, my father's sister's car, and here's a neighbor's car, and here's someone else with a friend's car. And I'm thinking, why are all these cars here together at the same time? Because I could understand if my aunt's car was here, I could understand if this one was here, I could understand if this car is here, but why are they all here at the same time, right? And as I went to the front door, My dear mother came out and she had the most pitiful look on her face. And she said, you haven't heard, have you? I said, father died, didn't he? Yes, he died this afternoon. He was working. He'd been cutting a tree down and trimming a tree and he had gathered all the brush into a big pile. And, and uh, just after he finished, he turned around and just, just fell over dead exerted himself too much. You know what I thought? I could have been there. I should have been there. I could have been helping him. He wouldn't have been exerting himself so much. If he had the heart attack, I could have done CPR. I could have helped him. I knew how to do CPR. And I want to tell you, there's been times I would have easily traded every material possession I have if I could have five more minutes with my dad, just five, because my dad wasn't a Christian. To my knowledge, he never accepted Christ as Savior. At times when I was younger, I heard him mock religion. I heard him show disrespect to religion. As he got older, he got softer, and he didn't seem so disrespectful, but it didn't mean he was positive either. But what I would have given to have had five more minutes to say one more time, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want you to accept him as your personal savior. How much would that time be worth to you if you were me, friends? Think about that. Think about that. We do not know the uncertainty of life. In James chapter 4, verse 13, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. I have wasted years of my life. I don't know about you, but I've wasted years of my life. And I'm tired of wasting years of my life. I'm tired of that. I want to do something that will make a difference. We don't know the uncertainty of life. Probably some of you have heard of John Lennon. He was one of the famous Beatles, the musical group from Great Britain. And he made a statement in 1966 that shocked a lot of people. He said, we're more popular than Jesus now. And he claimed that the Beatles would 
live on. In 1971, Lennon released a song called Imagine. And in that song, he wrote, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. At the very height of his stardom, nine years after he made this song, Lennon was shot dead by Mark David Chapman in New York City on December the 8th, 1980, totally unaware of what was going to happen, totally unaware. In the biblical sense, we have this story. There was a day when Herod was giving a speech and he thought he was on top of the world. And it says in Acts chapter 12, verse 21, and upon a set day, set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, set upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. Now Herod had a choice. He could have said, no, don't say that about me because I'm no God. Or he could stand there in pride and take that, those, those accolades in, couldn't he? And that's what he did. But notice it says in verse 23, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave, up, gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Beloved, our time, our time is almost up. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 11, Romans 13 and verse 11, Paul says, and knowing, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. He says, knowing the time, that it is high time. Now, the Greek word for time here is not chronos. You probably have heard the Greek word chronos, but this is a different Greek word. This is keros. The Greek word keros. And this concept is not applicable to time as a broad and abstract notion. Instead, it pertains to specific, quantifiable, or predetermined time frames, as well as to critical periods and seasons. The believers in Rome needed to recognize the pivotal moment in which they had existed. Consequently, Paul exhorted them to cast aside any lukewarm or Laodicean attitudes to see to cease from self-indulgence and to embrace the transforming act of putting on the Lord Jesus. He says it is high time, that means the current time. One translation says this, now it is all the more urgent for you to know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Friends, we need to wake up. Time is something that's so valuable. Time is so valuable. You own nothing that's more valuable than time. And the minute that you have right now is already gone. And the minute we have right now is already gone. Now, I think Sherry mentioned to you when she was talking about health the other day that I've been on this exercise program for about six and a half years. And I haven't missed a day doing it. And it's sometimes a little hard to get it done. But we use these watches, you know, the people buy these sport watches and, and uh, things that keep your steps and keep your miles and statistics. And we do that. But one of the, one of the things that this watch takes, it takes account on, on how often you're standing up. Are you standing up frequently through the day? Okay. And Sherry and I, we were out on a walk uh, a few weeks ago and we were looking at our watches. And I realized that she had an hour more than I did. She had an hour more because she was up making the lunch one day and I was sitting on the couch writing some studies out. And so during that hour, she was up moving around. And I was sitting down. Yeah, you do need to stand up, don't you? Everybody, let's just stand up for a minute. Can we do that? Can you stand up for one minute? Come on, stand up. Aren't you ready? I need to stand up, make you feel better. Make you feel better. Move your arms. Get awake. Get, a, you know, get out of that sleepiness we've been in. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Uh, stretching too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, people who know me well, people who know me well know that I can be, uh, I don't, I hate to use the word competitive, but I, I'm very zealous about certain things. And when I saw that she had an hour more than I had, I said, what? This is not possible. 
But you know what I realized? I realized if she kept standing up, then I would never catch her because I was already behind. I could never catch up with her. I think she says I held her down in the last hour. I wouldn't let her get up. Friends, that's, that's just an illustration. Once you lose it, you can't get it back. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, though, we have an interesting statement. Ephesians 5, verse 16. Paul says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. In other words, he says, you're buying back the time. How can you buy the unviable? That's what he says to do here. In fact, he not only says to do it there, but he says in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Still the concept of somehow buying back, redeeming the time. Now, Ellen White, when she's speaking in one place about the proper use of time and balancing out work and recreation, she said this, their time may be ever employed to advantage and they be constantly refreshed with variation and yet be redeeming the time so that every moment will tell with good account to someone. She speaks about redeeming the time, but she's been talking about in the context, and this is from volume three of the testimonies, page 22.2. She's been talking about balancing out work and recreation. We have this proverb, all work and no play make Jack a poor boy, right? So the idea is that we need a certain amount of recreation. If all you do is work, 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 you know, your body will break down, your mentality will break down. There has to be a certain amount of balance, but you just can't have play and recreation all the time. No work either, can you? But Ellen White here is speaking about using your time properly, using it to its best advantage, and she equates that with redeeming the time. Writing to a brother, Jay, whose experience was in sad shape, and this is in volume five of the testimonies, she said this. Paul exhorts, his Ephesian brethren, to redeem the time because the days are evil. This exhortation is very applicable to you. Now, she's writing to his brothers having these issues. In one sense, it is impossible to redeem time. For once gone, it is gone for how long? Forever. But you're called upon to reform, to be zealous of good works in the same degree that you have been negligent of duty. Turn square about, Double your diligence to make your calling and election sure. Keep God's commandments and live and his law as the apple of your eye. She goes on to say, wake up, wake up. You have work to do and your sun is fast hastening to its setting. In other words, your life isn't going to be around here forever, friends. Your powers are becoming enfeebled. But all there is of you, every particle of your ability belongs to God and you should be used and should be used earnestly and disinterestedly in his service. Work while the sun still lingers in the heavens, for the night cometh when no man can work. So again, she's speaking about this concept of redeeming the time. It means to use the time that you now have forward in the best possible way. So maybe during this camp meeting, friends, we haven't been at every meeting. Or maybe we've not been careful and, and we've let a lot of good opportunities pass. Don't continue. You know, when I get done, I think Brother Zadok's going to make a presentation. Listen to that presentation. Get the most out. Don't miss it. Writing to those who were assembled for a camp meeting in Michigan, 1881, Ellen White spoke about redeeming the time, making the best use of it in these words. She said, The Lord the Lord still has purposes of mercy toward us. There is room for repentance. We may become the beloved of God. I entreat you who have put afar off the appearing of our Lord, commence now the work of redeeming the time. What are they supposed to do? Commence now the redeeming of the time. Study the word of God. Let all this meeting make a covenant. Let, let all at this meeting make a covenant with God to put away light and trifling conversation and frivolous, unimportant reading, and for the coming year, diligently and prayerfully study the Bible, that you may be able to give to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with hope that is within you with meekness and fear. You will not, without delay, I'm sorry, will you not, without delay, humble your hearts before God and repent of your backslidings. 
So here again, she's emphasizing, use the time well. And again, friends, there is no, there's no talent. There's no gift. There's no position you have that is more valuable. There's nothing that you're going to be held more accountable in the judgment for the use of than your time. It is of life and death matter. We have been told our time belongs to God. Every moment is his, and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to his glory. Of no talent he has given us will he require more strict account than of our time. Christ Object Lessons 342.1. Now, the Bible says all the tithe of the land is the Lord's, right? And so we believe in giving him one-tenth of our income as a tithe and then offerings as God has enabled us, right? But does that mean I own that nine-tenths? Is the one-tenth all that God owns? God actually owns all of it, doesn't he? It's all his. We only return a tenth as an acknowledgement that it's all his. We keep the seventh day Sabbath. We're friends, God owns the whole week. He, he owns the whole week. And we're accountable the whole week for him. And we keep the seventh day Sabbath in part to acknowledge that all of it is his, as well as that day. In Christ Object Lessons, it continues and says, the value of time is beyond computation. Christ regarded every moment as precious. And it is thus that we should regard it. Life is too short to be trifled away. We have but a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity. We have no time to waste, no time to devote to selfish pleasure, no time for the indulgence of sin. It is now that we are to form characters for the future immortal life. It is now that we are to prepare for the searching judgment. Can you say amen to that? If you've read The Great Controversy, and I hope all of you adults and many of you young people even have read the book Great Controversy, if you haven't, shame on you. I mean, that shame on you. You know about the person I have on the screen called John Wesley. You've heard of John Wesley. If you've read Great Controversy, you know about John Wesley. <clears throat> well, now I've been preaching myself for about 45 years. 45 years. And if I preach twice a week, if I preach a Sabbath meeting, if I preach a Wednesday night meeting, well, that's that's about 100 times a year I'll be preaching. And 100 times 45 would be about 4,500 sermons I've preached in my career. But most likely, it's probably much closer to seven or 8,000 total, because many times I've preached more. If I come to a camping like this in a week, I might preach eight or 10, 15 times. So even if I'm a little extravagant and go to 8,000, I've maybe preached 8,000 sermons in my life, and you might think, that's a lot of sermons, Brother Allen. But I want to tell you what John Wesley did. He preached more than 40,000 sermons. More than 40,000 sermons. He traveled without an automobile without a train, without an airplane, he traveled 300,000 miles or nearly 15 times around the circumference of this globe in his lifetime. Can you imagine that? I think Wesley was trying to make good use of his time. Continuing Christ Object Lessons, she says, the human family, and this is the same continuation, page 342.3 now, the human family have scarcely begun to live when they begin to die. And the world's insistent labor ends in nothing, in nothingness, unless a true knowledge in regard to the eternal life is gained. The man who appreciates time as his working day will fit himself for a mansion and for a life that is immortal. It is well that he was. It is well that he was born. As we were coming in, Sherry pointed out to me over on the ridge there. There's a, I guess you'd call it a mansion. It's a pretty fancy place that you can see. It's maybe a kilometer or so over past this property, looks pretty nice. And people work and work and work to make mansions. They work to get fancy cars. You know, People will expend their health to get wealth. And when they get older, they'll spend all their wealth to try to gain their health back. And what is it for? It's for nothing, friends, if it's not for eternal life. God has a mansion he's preparing for each one of us. The question is, will we be able to have it? Will we be able to access it? Continuing Christ Object Lessons, just a little bit more. We are admonished to redeem the time, but time squandered can never be recovered. We cannot call back even one moment. 
the only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of that which remains by being co-workers with God in his great plan of redemption. Parents, I speak to the parents for just a minute. Brother Anthony's been speaking a lot to you and I appreciate the things he said. Train your children while you have the time to do it. Train your children while you have the time to do it because I don't care what you think today, they will be grown tomorrow. I don't care what you think today, they're going to be grown tomorrow. Do not delay their training because the training is only for a short time. It's your responsibility to instill in your children the importance of time and its proper utilization. You must impart the understanding that engaging in activities that honor God and benefit humanity is a pursuit worth striving for. I, maybe it was Anthony or someone was saying that, you know, we, we want to train up our children not only just to be Christians, we want to train them up to be workers for God. We want to train them to be workers for God. We want them to know that the things that they are doing is going to bring honor and glory to God and benefit their fellow human beings. Even in their early years, children can serve as missionaries for God in many ways. We are told that parents cannot commit a greater sin than to allow their children to have nothing to do. What do you think about that? Isn't that something? If you're a parent, what's the worst thing you can do? Let your, let your child raise itself. Let your child raise itself. Don't let it have anything to do. Let it be idle all the time. Now, I know Ellen White makes a statement about the children being free as little lambs up to a certain age. I understand that there are balances to this. But, beloved, our children need to be trained and they need to be put to work. They need to be put to work in the fields, working with the crops. They need to be put to work with a track in their hands down the streets. And they need to be busy. They need to be busy because idleness is the devil's workshop. The neglect of keeping your children busy leads to a love of idleness resulting in the development of indolent and unproductive individuals. As these children grow older and enter into the workforce, they approach their tasks with a lazy attitude, exhibiting remuneration, expecting excuse me, remuneration comparable to those who exhibit faithfulness. A stark contrast exists between such lackadaisical workers and those who recognize the importance of being diligent stewards. And so, friends, we are indeed to use our time well. In Romans chapter 12, Romans 12, verses 9 to 11. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Not slothful in in business. Fervent in spirit, not slothful in business. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, not slothful in business. Hmm. Do you know what a sloth is? What is a sloth? A sloth is a type of animal that moves extremely slow extremely slow. You can watch a sloth move across a branch and almost imperceptibly it moves from one position to another after several minutes and you don't hardly really see it even moving. So we have this term slothful. It means you don't apply yourself. You just take your time. You're never in a hurry. Friends, we got a lot to do. It's time to get on the ball. It's time to be fervent and not slothful serving the Lord. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, he says, whatsoever the hand findeth to do, can you do it lackadaisically? Can you do it any way you want? Whatever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work nor device nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave where thou goest. Friends, we're all going to that grave if time carries too long. And we won't do anything there. You better do what you can right now, especially your parents on it. And us who are the older generation. But again, even our younger people, even our younger people, we know not what tomorrow holds young people. I remember coming home from college one time and I told my mom, I said, you know, mom, I think I'm going to call it Joe. We're going to go motorcycle riding because Joe was one of my good friends. Joe Hall was his name. And, and he had a motorcycle and I had a motorcycle. And we'd go out in the, in the hills and ride. And 
Mom said, can't do that. And I said, what do you mean I can't do it? She said, Joe was killed this week in a car wreck. A man who was, who was drinking alcohol was drunk, hit him head on and killed him. He was a young guy just like me, but now he's gone. We don't know what's ahead. In Colossians chapter three, and I like this verse. And whatsoever you do, whatsoever you do. And friends, we should only be doing the right things, right? Amen. We should only be doing the things that please the Lord. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto the man, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. I like to say that there is a time yet that we are to apply ourselves to. And I believe it's the most important time that we can apply ourselves to. In Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12, he says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time. It is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Beloved, it's time. It's time to seek the Lord. If we have been holding back something from God, it's time to let it go. If we have not been seeking God as we should, and if we've been neglecting things, it's time to take care of those things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, where it says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, Behold, now is what? Now is what? The accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Beloved, what have we done with our time during this camp meeting? What are we going to do with our time when we leave here? Are we going to piddle it away in nothingness? I've got a tablet here. I use it for my notes a lot and other things. And we've all got one of those crazy phones, don't we? We've all got one of those crazy phones. How much time are we spending just doing nothing on those devices other than staring at them? You know, I mean, probably no one values their phone in here as much as I do. I use it for a lot. It's a very good tool, but it's just a tool. But if I use it for something that's not designed for or that I shouldn't be using it for, I'm wasting my time on. It's amazing. I can see kids even two and three years old, and they know how to run these phones. They know how to pinch and zoom, and they know how to get to the next picture, and they know how to get to the games and things on. It is crazy. It is crazy. And we are training our children for hell, friends. We're training our children for hell. Don't you think we're not? Allowing those children to have those electronic devices at those ages, it, and you are training them for hell. I'm going to tell it straight. But don't don't try to prevent training them from hell if you're training yourself for hell at the same time. Does that make sense? Do you, do you get me? Do you understand me? Are we together on that one? So, beloved, thank you so much for letting me come to Kenya. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and your friendliness, your willingness to, to love me and accept me for who I am and what I am and for accepting Sherry like you have. I, I can't tell you what's meant to us. We've just loved Kenya. It's not so much the topography of the land. It's some of it's quite pretty, but it's the people. We've loved the people. We've loved you. And I want you to love us, but I want you to love the word of God more. And I want you to obey the word of God. It doesn't matter if you like me. If I tell you something you don't like, that's okay as long as you obey the word of God. That's where it's all at, friends. I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever see any of your faces again. Paul, by inspiration, when he met with the elders at of Ephesus when he called them to the island of Miletus. He said, I'll see your face no more. He knew by inspiration he would never see them again. I don't know if I'll see you or not. It'd be really nice if I can. It'd be wonderful if I can. But if I don't, if I don't, let's use our time well. Let's get this work finished so that we can have a reunion sooner rather than later. What do you say? Is that what you want? It's what I want. Let's kneel for prayer. Our Father in heaven, 
we thank thee so much for thy blessings to us and thy love and compassions and mercy. And we thank you, Father, for the time of this camp meeting and now help us, each one, to redeem the time for the days are short. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you and God bless each one of you.